Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are here to, and thanks for joining us for the Alumni Career Pathways Series. Um, this uh, tonight's uh, panel is the, about visual arts entrepreneurship and uh, the career pathways within that. Uh, we have Brian McBay, Chelsea Yule, uh, Philip Dion. I'm probably saying that wrong. Sorry, Philip. And I am Shannon McKinnon, and I'm the director of Career Development and Work Integrated Learning. And Annie Canto will be our moderator for tonight. So I'm going to give a go over the brief bios. Uh, so Annie is a visual artist and educator living on the unceded homelands of. Help me out. And uh, Squamish speaking peoples in Burnaby, British Columbia. The underpinnings of her socially engaged art practice use critical race theory and women of color feminist theories to question the complex systems that govern our relationships. Despite theoretical frameworks lurking beneath her work, Canto comes at these weighty issues from the side with an irreverently serious playfulness. In her installation and print-based practices, Canto shepherds us towards the quiet moments, those slippery experience of social rupture and its flip side of kinship and belonging. Her practice looks at moments that normally slip under the radar, the misconceptions, the halting attempts, the fault lines, and the absurd, all those unintentionally telling moments that expose things we simultaneously fear and long for. She currently works as the events coordinator at Solid State Community Industries in Surrey, BC, and teaches foundation courses here at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Our panelists are Brian McBay. Uh, Brian was a student co-founder and current executive director of 221A, a BC-based nonprofit arts, housing, and cultural infrastructure organization based on the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh um, territories. Brian is a fourth generation settler of mixed Chinese Canadian descent and is an advocate for the fair payment of artists and the role of arts and culture in city planning. He was named a 2018 fellow at the Salzburg Global Forum and has been appointed to a variety of community and public sector boards in Canada, including the BC Arts Council, Chinese Canadian Museum, National Gallery of Canada, and the Vancouver International Film Festival. Chelsea Ewell is the assistant curator at the Capture Photography Festival, where she coordinates the annual catalog and featured exhibition and public art program. Curatorial highlights include 88 artists from 88 years in 2017, intertwined in 2018, Emily Carr University of Art and Design Eat Your Tail, Access Gallery 2020, and Here and Now 2023 and On Time in 2024, Pendulum Gallery. She continues her curatorial work in non-traditional pathways by working with Public Consulting and Zebra Club, Vancouver. Ewell holds a BFA from Emily Carr University of Art and Design and attended the MoMAS Emerging Critics Residency in 2021. She is an editorial committee at the Peripheral Review. Ewell is based on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Philip Dion has worked in preparation for over 20 years, preparing exhibitions for the Vancouver Art Gallery, Contemporary Art Gallery, YVR, and many other public and private exhibition spaces. He was part of the unionized drive at the CAG and served on the executive committee of the Arts and Cultural Workers Union from 2020 to 2023. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Okay, is this on? Hi. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Hi again. Uh, okay, so once again, I'm, I'm Annie. I'll be... Um, the moderator for today for this amazing panelist that we'll be talking to. Um, to get things going, uh, feel, make people feel a little bit more comfortable as you spread your words across the, across the stage here, I'm gonna ask you each uh, to answer one question to kind of ground us, but also I'd like to throw in a little fun question. 
uh, based on some conversations that were just happening. So um, I'll have you go around uh, maybe just one more time, say uh, your name and maybe one of the organizations you'll be talking about today. And then um, the fun question, we're all here as alumna of Emily Carr, so maybe one silly memory from your time as a student. Time to think about that. And then uh, my, my question, which I'll remind you after you get through memory, memory lane, is um, just to define entrepreneurship in the arts, which is what we'll be talking about today. So name, organization, fun memory, and then I'll ask you again about arts entrepreneurship. Okay, should we start with, should we start with you? Hello, uh, Brian McBay. My pronouns are he, him. And I'm going to be speaking about 221A mostly, which was co well, I was one of the co founders as a student here at Emily Carr, not actually here, it was on Gravel Island. And there's an old saying that you shouldn't have more speakers than audience members. And we're almost, we're almost there. <laughs> but maybe online we can, if you add the tech, then we definitely, we've got it. Um, funny story I was riding a skateboard down the hallway. Um, back in on Grand Island, they had a concourse gallery, it was called, right? Uh, which is very similar. They had, let's convert the hallway into kind of also an exhibition space. I don't know if it's a good idea, but anyways, we do it. And so I rode my skateboard down there, and I think I hit into the president's foot at the time, which is uh, Ron Burnett. So it actually resulted in a relationship where I started doing some graphic design work for Emily Carr. I didn't expect that. And I even made the website, it was a really bad one, for the launch of Emily Carr when it became a university. So I shouldn't say it was a really bad one, but, you know, compared to today's standard. Okay. Hi, I'm Phil. I'm a he, him. Um, the question is the organization. I am, I worked at a number of art galleries, but I guess... The one I'd talk about right now is the Arts and Culture Workers' Union based out here in Vancouver, which is a trade union that is starting to represent artists, uh, artists, art workers, and people who work in other kinds of cultural things. We represent workers at Contemporary Art Gallery, um, Cineworks, Gachet, Gachet yeah, and uh, the most recent one was Griffin at Center A as well but most recent one is Griffin. Uh, so we're growing in the community. Uh, I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, Fun I'm, memory. Yeah, I'm class of 96. I remember when I started, the art school had an art supply store of its very own. Yeah, it, it wasn't, yeah, Priovis. It was off Granville Island and it was a very small store, but <clears throat> they sold art supplies at cost to students. And to buy things, you had to um, tell them your student number. So I have my student number from then memorized <laughs> to this day. It's 921026. Oh, wow. Are you ever trying to use it at the grocery store? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know how to get into your lab. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Chelsea Yule. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm primarily going to talk about the work that I do at Capture Photography Festival um, and Public Consulting and Zebra Club because they all kind of fold into each other. And um, Zebra Club is kind of where I get to have a lot more freedom and actually sell people's art. So, um, and a funny story is also I'm class of 2019, so just before the pandemic, um, I went to the Granville Island um, School as well as this one. And um, I, there's a funny story where um, in the old, like the Granville Island li Emily Carr Library, um, I was doing some work at one of the computers and someone was like sleeping beside me. I was, didn't think anything of it. And then I realized it was a prop. Someone had created like a double of someone napping in the library and I just like lost it. I thought that was so funny. Um, so that's just one one cute sentimental story from Emily Carr. Very nice. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, so let's get serious now. No more, no more thinking about your fun memories. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about uh, what you think about arts entrepreneurship. I guess what that what that phrase means when you think about it, and more specifically, um, 
what's, uh, what, if you could name one thing, this is a really hard question actually, if you could name one thing that's helped you like build and sustain a career in arts entrepreneurship, what, what would you say it is? Whoever's ready can go first. And you're welcome to also bounce, you know, across each other too. Um, so how I would define like um, art entrepreneurship is actually relationship building um, and it's collaboration. So um, I do that with like, I'm really interested in meeting people also outside of the arts and in the arts and connecting them. Like there's been even like parties that I've hosted and friends have gotten jobs or like started art, like art collaborations together or just became really good friends to bounce ideas off of. So to me, it's just like, the professional and personal are all kind of like simultaneously one blob, which maybe in some industries isn't necessarily healthy. But I just am really passionate about like creating um, a sustainable ecosystem for artists, curators, and other cultural workers, including writers. So um, that's why I think in entrepreneurship to me is really community community building because it's your safety net, right? So when you, you need support, you're there and then in other ways you can pay that forward. Okay. <clears throat> this is a hard question for me <clears throat> because when uh, I was asked to talk at this, I had to phone and ask why on earth they wanted me to talk about <laughs> entrepreneurship. <laughs> Um, I'm not an entrepreneur, perhaps work for other people. We work for art institutions. And is, can I give you advice about doing that? I can, t I can tell you, don't do it long term. Working for our organizations as a prep is not a career. It's something you should do for maybe six years when you're young. It'll keep you poor for the rest of your life if you stay there. Uh, with curation or, you know, building, um, <clears throat> pardon me, nonprofits, there is a clear ladder where you have career growth. When you're a prep, you can be there for a long time and you maybe just get to be the prep at an institution, like a, the lead prep, which is where I'm at. And uh, it's not, it's not a place for you to have where you can have a middle-class life. It's not a job where you could end up with a home or having the spare money you would need to do things you want. So, some bleak advice for you there. <laughs> I am not an entrepreneur, and um, yeah, it's not, it's not a path if you're looking for a healthy um, life. Fair enough. There you go. But why it's important to have unions? I can talk about that, but we were just talking about entrepreneurs. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> there's some realism right there. That's good. No, it's helpful. I was gonna. I was, I was trying to beat you to the bottom, but I think you got. You got it. You got. It. Um, no, I, I think uh, um, at least with two two one a, it's sort of been about trying to find the best way to survive more than, um, and perhaps the smartest way to survive, not just the one that hurts the least amount of people, harms the least amount of people but hopefully has some kind of joy as well. And um, in the case of 221A, as I said, we, we started as a group of students. Um, yeah, we kind of had a very collective sort of ethos that we'd be better off eating a little less and having a little more together, but then maybe being able to surpass some barrier that we're all facing. So in our case, I think I did a talk at Emily Carr maybe 10 years ago, and the student asks, why, like, why did you guys, like, how could we possibly start what you did? Like, it's impossible. We couldn't do it again. Um, you know, now we're, we operate 10 buildings and, are, like, housing and other types of, you know, infrastructure that is substantial in nature. It all started just from people putting in money together to try to make a project. And so if everyone... At the time, there was maybe 100 people who showed up. This is like a small audience. So, but if everyone put in 50 bucks back then, it would have got you enough money to do something. And now maybe it's you guys have to put in $500 each, sorry, <laughs> the audience here. But I think uh, part of it is, yeah, imagining the collective, how the collective can change the structure and finding a way to build um, basically a conduit to do it where the community feels trust, 
um, where there's a kind of enough sort of investment from various parties without one person or many, you know, some leader taking over and running away with the money. So it's creating those systems and slowly building up. So I, I would say entrepreneurship, similar to you, I felt like is a, is a kind of a negative word. But I do want to put it, put that a little bit to the side because the arts and culture sector can be very puritanical. It can be very like you shouldn't make any money. Now, there's nothing wrong with making money. And your parents would be probably first to tell you that if you have parents. So, um, But, you know, you don't want to sell out. You just want to sell. And you want to sell fairly. And you want to make sure that the economy is working for people. So, yeah, that would be my positive note. <laughs> oh, nice. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get back to talking a little bit about... Um, arts and cultural unions in a second, but uh, there's an interesting connection between uh, what Chelsea said about relationships and um, your work at 221A. So I'm going to ask you a question here, um, maybe for a specific example. My question was, um, how do partnerships and collaborations play a role in how you're able to um, advocate for art, arts workers? And um, yeah, if you have an example of a partnership or collaboration that comes to mind, yeah. Yeah, sure. And maybe I'll just kind of invoke a little bit of the history of this place, which is, of course, uh, indigenous nations that collaborate, but also where I come from, which is my family's from Chinatown. We, we've, I've been here for four generations, and my grandparents ran a restaurant in Chinatown. And that restaurant um, became a kind of uh, organizing grounds, so, or because Chinatown was sort of a city within a city, they had to create their own buildings, their own social... Uh, systems, their own schools, their own cultural activities. And in fact, they blossomed despite the fact there's very little investment from the state and potentially even divestment from the state. And so um, over the years, people purchased properties uh, for social benefit. So family clans would purchase these properties. They would set out very specific altruistic objectives. I remember when we moved into one of the buildings we're in in Chinatown, they posted all the rents on the wall, like everyone's rents, like just straight up. It's like your marks being posted on the wall. Um, so you could just see. And then everyone was volunteers in their, in their 80s, right? These people. And so that history of social sustainability is something we have in, in Canada, in various places, different pockets of cultures, and something that I guess arts and culture workers, you know, even though especially the art side of of this school more than the design side, but the art side sort of, I'm not sure, maybe the teachers have uh, learned something. I don't know, this is <laughs> very harsh, but the, the, uh, there was this real drive towards individual, being making an individual art practice, being an individual genius, going to your individual studio to make your individual stuff. And of course, everyone is an individual, but there was that sort of idea that you have to go and craft a persona and sort of become an extractable, interesting commodity that some curator or potentially someone from a very, uh, like basically a, high, a very w wealthy class, a moneyed class, be interested in collecting not only, you know, the artwork you make, but your sort of social standing, your social capital. And so it's sort of a, a tough reality to try to bridge this idea of collaboration. When you walk through the hallways in this place, you see the joy of the commonality of being a student and at least I, I, I was just saying, I would wish I was in foundation every year for the rest of my life. But <laughs> of course, I'd be going nuts by now. Um, but anyway, before I go on for like 25 minutes, I think there's, yeah, there's always an opportunity to collaborate at every step of the way. Uh, for us, you know, we collaborate with other organizations quite directly. We also do quite a bit of cross-functional employment. So employees who work on one project, they're also working on another project, and that means this crossover. It also makes it very complicated. The more you collaborate, the more you need decent systems to make sure people are protected, things like unions. Or, and so if an, organizations are unable to basically be organized enough to you know, ensure the safety and also the functionality and comfort of people, then you have external uh, parameters that sometimes need to be put in place to protect people. So I, went to, I remember I was a chair of an HR committee for one of the largest museums in Canada and got to see the two unions negotiating um, with uh, the National Gallery. So I'd love to share a little bit about that after I don't hand it over to someone else to answer. <laughs> okay. 
Um, sure. Thank you. Um, well, I guess I guess since we're even kind of naturally spread up unions, maybe I'll ask a question about that. Um, I guess just to I guess just to set the set a foundation of what the ACWU is and stands for. Um, do you want to talk about the story of how you got involved? Um, sure. So <clears throat> uh, I was working at Contemporary Art Gallery, and um, we had, as a group of employees, we had some issues with how things were being run. And we were talking to each other about what we could do to change things in our workplace. There was some unfair treatment of certain people, you know, things that uh, are specific but are also very general across all sorts of organizations. And um, one of the things we explored is organizing ourselves into a union. Um, and I'm going to just do a little bit of explaining here. So trade unions exist in workplaces separate from the management, from the owners. So... It is a group of employees getting together to ask for something and taking their ability to work at that place as their leverage. So when I talk to some people about trade unions, they, they'll ask me, oh, I don't know if the management would like that, would let us do that. And in fact, you don't ask management about it. There's a legal process in place where the employees get together under the umbrella of a trade union and they have a protected status to create this organization and that way they can band together to ask for what they want from the employer. So, sorry, a little bit of explain, explanation to do that. So, uh, we as a group of employees uh, did some kind of auditioned a couple of unions and one of them was ACWU, which had just started and I don't think they had any other... Um, certifications except for the first organization that they kind of co-founded at the same time. <clears throat> anyway, uh, we decided to go with that union and uh, so the ACWU is uh, part of IATSE, which is a giant international union and they had uh, given us um, some money and some a lot of expertise and a lot of advice at the beginning when we started and so even though the union was this brand new baby, it had these experts behind it and uh, um, with some really good advice and some really good structures that they could apply. Um, and so, yeah, we signed our cards, which is the old-fashioned way that you'd form a union, but now it's basically you'd send, you'd send someone an email. Um, and once... 55% of the employees of a place have signed a card, then that place becomes a certified union uh, employer. Uh, and that means that even if everybody quits the next day, that place is still a unionized workplace. So uh, we did that and we went into negotiations. We took a deep breath and told everybody what we made because that's a big thing. People don't like to share the, what they make. And so when we finally did that, we found there were some real discrepancies. There was one person who was getting paid a third of what the, everybody else was, which was just terrible and was only brought to light because we shared this information. So we made a list of, uh, of I guess, demands or, and negotiated with management to bring everybody's pay up to what, at that point, Vancouver was calling a living wage. They don't do that anymore. They're not interested in setting what is a living wage in Vancouver. But at that time they were, and we brought everybody up to that, which felt like a really big step to do it all together and to bring everybody uh, up and, and to meet some other of the uh, workplace democracy issues we had. Um, so that's my specific experience there and a little bit of general thing about trade unions. that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank okay, you. Cool. Um, so the advice is then, if you're going to get a job in the arts sector, try to get unionized. Yeah, <laughs> there great. aren't many places that are unionized, but you can always unionize them yourself, which is actually a lot of fun. You kind of are sneaking around like a spy, having like 
little meetings off to the side, make sure management doesn't catch you. It was, a, it was an exciting time. Yeah, I think too. Just as, I think I've not been in that situation, but I can imagine too. The arts teams for a lot of organizations are quite small, mm-hmm. so sometimes you're unionizing against like one person who's your friend <laughs> who's into the idea is the the curator director. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's great for employees. It is. I think it's the only way forward to get out of that like depressing pit I described to you at the beginning. <clears throat> Um, I have a fun question, I get more fun question uh, that's kind of come up naturally about balancing um, the collective um, in all of your various works. You've already kind of mentioned um, working in a more collective sphere, working with other people as like a highlight of your careers. But at the same time, as Brian mentioned, um, there's like a solitude of being a creative person that's that's kind of lobbed onto a lobbed on to people as an idea of what you're supposed to be in the world. So I was just wondering if um, maybe we'll start with Chelsea, since you, since we haven't asked you a specific question yet, how do you balance um, kind of the balance the work you do in the collective versus the work you do on your own? I don't really do any work on my own um, because all of my work relies on artists' work. Um, so I, that's why I really love what I do is because it's truly always about relationships and partnerships and like meeting people where they're at and then supporting them to platform their work so that it can reach a greater audience in like unexpected places all around, um, Vancouver and that way, um, a variety of different publics can encounter that, that artwork. And it also, um, I have this catalog here that I um, have helped produce um, five of them already, one per like every festival. And that is also a collaborative um, project where not only am I gathering all of this like information from a variety of artists, writers, and curators, but I'm also and institutions, but I'm also working with corporations like Patterson or In Transit BC, in some cases TransLink, and then I'm also working with a designer, and then I'm also working with a copy editor and a proofreader, and then I'm also getting sign off from my boss, and then I'm also going to Mitchell Press to like test the, like go to press checks. So I don't work in a silo, I don't work on my own. Um, I might be emailing people in my bedroom office in East Vancouver, but um, the work I do is always collaborative, and that's the same at public consulting. It's like, uh, are you okay there? <laughs> um, and which is this small consulting firm um, that works with uh, civic bodies, developers, artists, and uh, various uh, cultural workers to be on selection panels. And I mostly coordinate meetings and sometimes work on these public art plans. And then um, with Zebra Club, it's that's obviously for profit. It's a retail store, um, and I like showing up in different unpredictable spaces to see what I can kind of like do and make happen. That's bigger than myself. Um, I feel like uh, I resonate with uh, the bleak future, the bleak past, present, of future of being an arts worker. But um, that is actually my motivator to do everything I can to not uh, be in those spaces and bring people along with me. Um, And so at Zebra Club, they have an artist residency program that I coordinate and I uh, work with like individual artists um, for the window display. And um, I get to leverage like my knowledge and resources of like working at Capture and Public Art because I have like a very strong like admin um, brain, I guess. I'm like a Sagittarius and a Capricorn, and those are like very distinct qualities for those astrological signs. Um, and that's where I get to have like a little bit more play and freedom because I don't have to ask like Pattison permission to put, you know, a woman's hand with long fingernails and pearls on a billboard, which was um, maybe I'll have time to talk about to some degree, like that sort of uh, very delicate and um, like Herculean uh, effort to have this like billboard project present throughout the city. Um, but it's a lot more playfulness and the artist, if they sell their work, they get 100% of the sale and then I just support them basically. And so I like with install, picking up artwork, promoting their work on like online on our website. So um, yeah, that's... It's, I'm always tethered to one other person. 
before we move on, I want to ask you a follow-up question. <laughs> um, just to, just reflecting on my personal experience as well, um, I'm not sure what your degree was when you graduated from here. What was it? It was long. Uh, critical and cultural practices with a minor in curatorial studies. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is great because I was just wondering, like, I graduated with a master's of fine arts from here and also got into arts administration and administration in various ways in different non-for-profits. And I was just wondering, like, where where did you learn the skills? <laughs> like when you graduated from here, were you expecting to be able to manage people? I, I suppose did you like have a good experience, or did you learn it on the way? Um, I'll briefly. I would say I, I like learned it on like ground zero. Basically, the first semester I was at Emily Carr, um, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make any money because <laughs> being an artist is such. Like, I don't think, I, I I love, obviously I love art, but um, I'm like obsessed with it, but I um, can't, I, did, I knew I didn't have the idea to be an artist. So I was like, how can I still be part of this world? And then um, I looked in, I was like interested in the exchange program. So work towards um, getting into that. I was successful in that. I was part of the, I was really interested in like how this school worked, like who were making the decisions, how are decisions being made? So I was, was part, how are events happening? So I was part of the students union. Then I got onto the board of governors and then, um, I was doing that for a couple of years. I also, um, became interested, there was a side committee for like student exhibitions and I was like, there needs to be more art in this school. Um, it's like super boring. Like we need to nurture the, this like kind of connection point for artists to know that they it can be really easy to put up their artwork um, in the space, like in the concourse, for example, and possibly other spaces with like fewer barriers. And um, so I did that for a couple of years, ended up getting paid for that job, like a $10 an hour or something like that. And then, um, but at least I created like, I'm, my next goal is basically to start creating like artist economies or like sustainable artist economies. And you kind of are doing that as well with your work. Um, and then I did co-ops. That was the other thing. So I was doing all, like I was just treated school as like my incubator. My like actual coursework wasn't gonna really teach me any hard and soft skills important intellectual and critical thinking skills absolutely um it like that you can check that box off but not those sort of like time management um skill sets also this is coming from like i've, I've worked in the festival this festival for six years you learn real fast uh, and um but i've i worked at like a couple different not like three different nonprofits prior to going to um capture and then it just like you move really fast because uh, it's just a high volume of projects that I'm dealing with on a day to day basis. Yeah. So I've always been working. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That's actually that's a great um, kind of transition story. Um, I also admired students like you when I was in art school, like who really took advantage of it. I mean, retrospectively, I admire you for doing that. For me, I was just oh, like goofing off. Mm. So looking back at my time at art school, I have a lot of respect for students like you who took full advantage of what was offered because I just spent four years playing. Yeah. So, yeah, that's all. Well, no, I'm starting to... No, I'm actually starting to play, so... Uh, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I think that's the writer. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, now I want to talk about playing, but uh, I want to... <laughs> I'm going to ask Brian a question, I think, uh, just because we're talking about um, systems. And I think that that's a lot of, I don't even know how to get into how many systems 221A has to manage with all the different projects that are going on with different organizations, municipalities, the collaborations. So I guess to form it into a question, I wonder, maybe uh, same kind of vein. Did you know you were going to get into kind of systems creation? And how much is that part of your, of your life, of your work? Yeah, I guess um, a little bit similar to Chelsea, maybe less productive, but we were like, you know what? We're going to be artists now, or designers, a lot of us are designers. We will be studying. We're like designers, it was a bit egotistical, you know, we're like, we're going to be studying. Because part of it was, 
we are young people who have a particular perspective on the world and we feel that our our teachers don't really see that perspective. And part of it was technological. And early on, it was that it was actually we were fascinated by the animation between art and design. And we thought, you know, back to this critique of the individual, we thought, well, design brings a lot more of this teamwork element to it. There's an economy to it that's very different, but it's also devoid of a lot of that social theory and the, you know, important history and the critique. And so why can't we bring them together? Sort of that, and it was a very open, sort of generous way of th doing things. So we had like poets with us, <laughs> you know, industrial designers, and da 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 da. We bring them everyone together. So um, yeah, I don't know. I guess at the time we didn't have any expectation that the art side would be where things would take off. We would really be just doing design work. And first, about five years of two two one a, we didn't have any money. In, in fact, we were very uh, kind of. Um, as uh, alongside our sort of critique of everything, I guess, was the idea of uh, adopting any form of convention, you know. And so in that space of kind of nebulous, long conversations late into the evening with your friends, eating, making music and other things, then we just uh, eventually came to this idea that, oh, we should, we should probably incorporate something, formalize a convention so then we can critique it. Because if otherwise we're just going to be sitting here like doing circles forever. Some of us, our visas are going to expire in one year, so we better get some get our shit together. But um, yeah, I think we didn't expect to be applying. I guess uh, the work doing the work we do today. It has been many many chapters of change since then. So, and part of it I think that we've learned is that our design background, particularly my design background, and a couple others who have kind of paddled hard enough to stay around <laughs> with 221A. Um, we brought that design background to the, into the art world. And I remember one of our professors back then, um, Liz Mager, said to us, oh, and you know, Liz Mager's sculpture is brilliant, right? You'd say it's a lot of it's kind of a, the experience of everyday life, sort of reformatted into this quite tactile, textural, um, and moving kind of experience. She said to us, so there's more space for design in the art world than there is for art in the design world. And for us, I think I'll slow that down. There's more space to bring design, so design thinking and design work, collaboration, all these other things you think about design into the art world, um, advertising, photography, than there is for art to go into the design world, which is you know working for corporations, making advertisements and stuff, making vehicles or whatever else. And that was our experience too, because I worked as a basically doing gigs as a designer for many years uh, in order to make two to one a happen and on the back end of it. But yeah, we did end up finding that in the art world, there's this big need for people to make systems, if you want to call it that, or um, social structures. Um, and you know, art, I think, seems to desourcize itself from everything else. It says, oh, we're part of our own little world. It started in New York. And then it eventually came to us kind of thing and sort of doesn't remember the social history of this place. And so back to the Chinatown or wherever, wherever there are spaces here in Canada, um, yeah, there's certainly systems out there that can be adopted and repurposed in different ways like unions. So it is very exciting to see like movements like that come about because it's just, it's like about time. Let's get our shit together, you know, as a group. And I'm kind of tired of being the one beating the drum, really pushing it forward because we've had to. And and I guess in a way that may be kind of from government perspective and, you know, um, I'll make this clear, the art system in Canada is funded by government. So um, a lot of it is about competing with your peers in front of government to receive some kind of funding. And then even eventually, potentially, getting into the market, but there's a pretty big feeder kind of economy driven by government that gets you into the market, if, if you're lucky. You know, it's like a very small sliver, like something about out of the 215 units uh, that we operate at 221A, one, one or two of those artists are selling works for 80,000 euros in Germany or whatever, so it's not like a very common thing. So anyway, we found ourselves, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately uh, for the sector, I don't know, uh, using our design skills 
to kind of navigate urban dynamics and some of the social history elements of it. And then now we're sort of like, we're like a weed that grew out of a crack that's like bearing fruit. Um, so. Do you feel that um, what you're doing is picking up the slack that kind of the system, I think from the 70s, that uh, was mostly funded by the government has kind of started dropping. Like it seemed to me, the artist run center model started kind of not being able to serve the community starting kind of in the 90s and it, was, it seemed to be in decline. Do you feel like, is that the crack you're talking about? Like, I see lots of different cracks. I yes. like that, but um, okay. is it okay if I answer that? Okay, just, we're just going on our own oh, now. No, Rogue. let me in here. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, I mean, from a historical standpoint, um, I, the government funding sort of, yeah, a lot of dried up in the 90s, uh, or at least sunset, like flattened out. Yeah. Um, and so that was, yeah, uh, maybe part of the reason why the generation all of us are part of have been sort of, required to come up with new systems, whatever they may be, in order to build economies, or we just don't exist, which is also what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so you have to understand in the 60s and 70s, there was funds that came out from federal government, from provincial government, from and that really were like substantial uh, to support artists to do experimentation and these types of things. And then that sort of legacy, I think, is really deeply... It's like the sacred cow of our community. Like those were the, those were the times, and it was all about radical experimentation and all that. And we really have that deeply embedded in people's brains, and a lot of the professors here have that. And mm -hmm. and so I think um, that image needs to be broken. And back to the puritanical, and, and not to say that we can't honor those moments, but that history can't be re. It's not going to be redone, and it's actually doing us a disservice to look down on people for trying to survive. You know, it's like they, people need to make, make money, especially people want to bring equity into the conversation. They say, oh, we're going to bring people of color and bring these people. I'm like, you know, these people, like, hey, they need to make some money. Like, it's, I mean, everyone needs to make money, but you're not going to find, like, you're going to say, oh, it's a problem that this, uh, um, this artist is selling their wares, you know, and therefore we're not interested in, you know, they've kind of, uh, sh shot themselves in the foot in terms of being able to gain um, an attraction in a market. Instead, it's sort of, yeah, we're relying on the curators and, and uh, I'll appeal to you is to see that need of an economy as, as part of an overall kind of system deficit or divestment from government. So, you know, I'm trying to do my best to advocate and push for government to keep investing. And there was definitely some bump in the last few years, but right now is a kind of painful period and... Uh, um, you know, when I graduated, kind of when 221A started getting going around 20, 2009, 2010, there was also an economic crisis and all those things. So we kind of looked at, kind of looked at the banks collapsing and then looked at government. We we're like, oh, I don't know. I might as well just get together with our friends and like, I don't know, sit by a fire and try to get some ideas going. So, which is really what people have been doing for generations. Kelsey, I keep seeing you touch the mic. Did you have a response? <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, thanks. Um, well, where should we go from here? I think um, I kind of wanted to bring up I kind of wanted to bring up a qu two very different questions, one about playing and one about logistics, which is money, which we've brought up a couple times. Um, but um, I don't know. I was maybe we'll start with the financial question. Just as like a practical question for um, students listening to this uh, panel. Um, what what is my question? What kind of advice can you give, or like, can you give us stories of how you funded the things that you wanted to do? Because um, as a as in retrospect, um, the stories that you're telling sound amazing. Like, um, I remember as a student coming to panels like this, I'm like, oh, I can, oh, I'm gonna do that. How am I gonna do that? And then when you graduate, you're like, oh, I have to make money. So um, yeah, do you have stories to tell about what what you're able to do to fund your 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 creative paths? I can start. Um, I have recently like 
first of all, I've kind of dedicated myself to be this like lifelong learner. And um, since being out of school, like I did this Coursera course on project management with um, like Google and PMI, which is the Project Manage- Management Institute. And then over the summer, I did this like McGill University online uh, financial literacy because as I'm getting older, I'm realizing like, oh shit, I have no money. Like um, I taxes and obviously and but just like um actually like building some kind of semblance of wealth um and being a little bit more cognitive of like expenses and um I was talking to this one artist who has been making art for a very long time and she was like being an artist is actually being like a small business owner. And so that was something that just sort of like never really clicked for me when I was um, at Emily Carr because I was so busy just like absorbing this experience. And so um, I really encourage you to like think about where maybe like how you can keep challenging yourself and doing things differently and definitely start maybe sooner with a financial literacy course. Like don't overwhelm yourself. You don't have to become like an accountant or like work at a corporation. Just like use that for yourself. And like um, that has helped me like advocate more for like what I want in like personal situations and like learn how to negotiate and like really, really also value other people's time and energy and making sure that like if I'm offering something, it's actually something worthwhile. Um, And so, yeah, I think there's just a lot that you can learn through kind of um, dipping your toes into something more um, business-like. And then, and I kind of, uh, I feel like in Emily Carr, it was just like, Capitalism, it, capitalism is evil, capital, and that's true. But also, this is how we exist, and um, I have to pay Telus and my landlord um, money so that I can continue doing what I want to do. So um, that's kind of like pract- some practical skills. And then grant writing, um, it's very difficult to get a grant these days, um, but still, don't lose hope. And... Um, it's a good practice and what I've always leaned on is like just talking to people about what you're doing and what you're interested in, what your blue sky dreams are and then that's kind of that collaborative um, sort of sitting by the fire or by the table where it just doesn't feel so isolating and scary and your dreams actually might be within reach or maybe not but at least you kind of tried and you learned something and um, sometimes it turns out better. But... um, sometimes not (laughs) and then you just carry on you get rejected and then you're like okay well what's next Uh, we're just giving yeah practical practical financial advice (laughs) I guess yeah come talk to Uncle Phil if you need a you know, practical advice about what not to do. Um, <clears throat> no, but really, I, I do think mentors are helpful and, you know, surrounding yourself with people who, who know different things, um, not like a kind of echo chamber, I guess they call it, online or whatever, but sort of learning from yeah, different professions and trades and people from different backgrounds. It's a good thing. I agree, like, just sort of learning how to write a budget. There's a lot of math, you know, if you can't do math, you're screwed. Like this is it's a basic math, like how much in, how much out, is there anything left? Where's it gonna go? And the big fight is where's it gonna go? Where do you guys want to use the money at the end if there's any left? And if there's none left, who's gonna pay? Are we gonna split it proportionately? You know, and that's kind of a big part of, of life. And and I think for us, anyways, we've had to figure out how to socialize those financial systems by which I mean our tenants and which are our friends we're our friends Um, when 221A started out you have to imagine the owners the users the audience and probably the speakers and all of the different titles were the same people who are all just looking at each other you know just like this room and that was uh, as you grow right and get bigger and bigger you have to build accountability and structures in to because all of a sudden you're saying I'm servicing you, 
and who's the you and you know are they actually receiving that service or not and there's all these different components to it so being able to demonstrate to other people that you're being accountable with their money is very very important for kind of social survival of any kind of collective and there's a point often with collectives where they sort of reach a point where it's just the money starts getting involved and there's a kind of fictitious labor layer that uh, I put in some work, I did sunk costs and you didn't, but we're all kind of equal because we're egalitarian, we're all the same, but you're kind of really actually pulling more weight than me. But my grandmother gave us 500 bucks, so you owe me something. I don't know what, you know, that kind of stuff starts happening. You start chopping it up and if you can't sort of work through it, it's kind of like being in a marriage a little bit, but you kind of work through it. It's more. Com it's one of the most complex things is human dynamics at scale um, and then coming up with systems. Fortunately, there is conventions out there for how we organize and work with each other, but every community will be a little bit different. And community building, I think Chelsea, you said at the beginning, was uh, uh, a lot about relationships. So it's like basically tending to, checking on people, and then at the same time, having somebody who's ethical on the math side. We had a CEO of a credit union on our board for a while, and he kind of whipped us into shape. He used to work as a, uh, a lead investigator going into credit unions in BC and um, checking to see that their governance structures were appropriate. In other words, they were actually not becoming just a bank, right? And credit unions are supposed to, to play a role to, for their communities. And so he, he provided almost like a, you know, it felt like a Senate hearing kind of level of <laughs> high demands. Um, but our finances are very tight um, in terms of their structuring, like each of our buildings are separated out, revenues and expenses, the proportion of labor is really clear, we can report out on it, and it's automated within a system that then there's tenants involved in our governance who can see it and be a part of it. And so, yeah, those types of things come about sometimes through luck. And, but for me, I've always been, I was always good at math, very helpful, I don't know. It's like one of the secrets, like, holy shit, that guy's good at math. It's like, yeah, well, he's, he's you know, like pretty good at math. But yeah, we never went into, well, my, yeah, I never really went into arts because I seemed like it would cost too much or it just wouldn't make any money. So somehow we managed here. Some immediate math. Yeah. <laughs> um, lost some people. So now I think oh. we're, we're winding. Oh, this, oh, and people don't like talking, talking about, about math and money. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I guess, okay, I was going to, I was going to ask you a specific, Philip, a specific question. Sure. Okay. And then I'll, I'll try to ask a super fun question. <laughs> Maybe your answer will be super fun. I guess, um, I was just going to open it up a little bit, uh, if we're talking about practical advice specifically to do with finances, but I was just thinking about, you have, uh, an extensive experience working in different, uh, in different organizations. So I wonder if you have any, um, it, like tips. What what do you think are some skills that that people need to have in order to navigate like different institutional spaces? Specific names of people to avoid. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> huh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> like, are you telling me like beach is like? I'm going to say be cheery, always, always smile. I don't know. Is that what you need to do? Be authentic. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's the easy one. Be authentic. No, I'm telling you to be authentic. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice. It's great advice. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the work I've done in organizations has always been really results driven. So the, the bottom line is just get, being able to get it done. And I guess that's, um, sometimes that happens despite the artists that you're working with. Sometimes they're part of it, which is great. Um, but yeah, I guess it's always to try and remain flexible and in, in, when it comes time to install an exhibition, I'm always the guy who says no because I'm in a room full of people who want to do this, that, and everything, right? You know, you ask an artist what they want to do in here, they will 
they have a list. And so <clears throat> I end up being the guy who's like thinking of the costs and what is actually possible with what we have. So I'm in this funny position where I'm always like, they bring the, they, the artist and the curator come to me and I'm like, well, we could do this, but we'd have to stop doing that. Or, you know, there's all these trade-offs. So, yeah. Uh, so I, I have become like the Mr. Negative in those situations, you know, when the, when the artist and the curators come to me. But um, I have to st stay conscious of that just so I don't come off as the grumpy guy. But, and to kind of explain that, you know, it's always a trade-off. And that, I guess, that comes, and knowing that, I think, comes from just experience. I can't just say, well, learn how to figure this out or that out. It is is just from having done it so long, I can say, well, this is a reasonable request in the time we have with the resources we have. Um, I don't know if that's blanket advice for fitting into any system, but it is what a prep has to do a lot of the time. Yeah. Well, I like what you said about, um, you know, being able to get things done. It does sound pretty capitalist, I suppose, but I think that I was just thinking about how there's a gap between, um, like, I think that the school or institution is built, is built around assignments, which is this, like, you know, built to, as a structure to show you that this is when you need to get everything done by. But there, I think there is a pretty big gap between what it looks like in school and what it looks like in real life. Um, uh, especially with the, like much more, many more constraints, like mm -hmm. you're talking about, um, and just in general, like who's the work, who's the work for? Um, you have to, yeah. There's a big transition between like figuring out if the work is for yourself or for your teacher, for your institution, versus um, figuring out what your motivator motivators are um, once you step out of this world and into something else. Yeah, yeah. Friends is a good one. Okay, my fun question now. Um, going off of what you said about saying no to people, I wanted to ask questions about what you all love about your work and what you hate about it. And um, to transition into these questions, I just wanted to know, um, Philip, what was the what's the weirdest thing you had to say no to? Hmm, that's tough because I've done a lot of weird things for okay. people. Okay, oh, so. that's even better. What's the what's one of the weird things that you've that you've done with an artist? Hmm. I think taking down the walls of the gallery so to to expose the stuff on the inside, like the interior of the like the gubbins on the wall. That was interesting. Yeah. Like the Yeah. Yeah, and through to like these windows that are covered up historically. Um, no, no, mostly bits of other artworks that have fallen behind. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, nothing outrageous that's going to like, I can just say that everybody's going to go, whoa, so sorry. I mean, but. that's pretty amazing, taking down the walls um, to see that like, the insulation, yeah. <laughs> wires, things like that. Wow. Okay. Okay. I'm going to come back to you to think sure. about, to think about like what, yeah, those two questions. What's something you love about your, about your work? And you don't have to stick to, I guess, the institutions we're talking about. It could you could just pick a work that you do? Everyone does extensive different things. So anyway, what's something that you love about your work? And then what's something your least favorite thing about it? Who wants to start. Um. A favorite thing about the work that I do is actually going to the do site visits for the public art projects and like seeing the work finally installed. Um, sometimes it's not always perfectly installed, but then that's quite humorous and then I just, it gets fixed. Um, so it's not really a big deal. And then the thing that I like the least about my job is asking permission from a, another entity on whether or not we can put a piece of artwork up. Um, cause a lot of, t just because of all the restrictions and, um, you know, we have to really be creative with the, the constraints that we're under, but yeah. Cool. Like, like, and dislike, right? Those are the two things I yeah. like, um, but my job, um, I guess I like that it's, uh, 
Uh, it's a lot of young people still. I mean, I guess consider myself young, but I don't know. <laughs> um, so I think the oldest person in our workforce is like 51 or something. Um, and a lot of racialized people, mostly BIPOC. So it makes it, I don't know, good food maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a kind of joy to, uh, to it. Um, and a lot of different people I get to meet. Um, <clears throat> working with government and things like that. Uh, what I don't like about it, um, yeah, I think uh, it's a uninvested kind of sector. So I don't know what other sectors feel like, but <laughs> this one certainly feels like pretty scant in terms of investment. And that means, um, yeah, the level of ingenuity and creativity. Like I'm fourth generation. I have wealth creation in my family, right, from a restaurant. If you're here new to this place or you just are in poverty, then, I mean, this is a tough place to be. And, um, you know, 70000 is the the minimum of uh, survival in this city uh, for salary. And, you know, that won't really even get you very far. So we're, it's like kind of in a very tough place, right, in the economy. Um, yeah, and I think also the, the projects we do often take a very long time, like up to 10 years. The last one we just opened took eight years and you set a date that it's going to be opened and then, you know, the construction delays, just like building technology is in a, at this state of denial in terms of its delays, like just delay, delay, delay. So you, you have to also, it's like delayed gratification to the next level. You have to suffocate your gratification, put it underground and don't even think about digging it up. Even when you see the balloons, I say congratulations because you know something might not be ready. <laughs> and then, you know, like six weeks after the opening, where you've already had the press conference, then you can dig it up. And by then, you don't even care. You're just like, oh, thank God it's done. I would get out of here. So, you know, it's a little hard. Capital projects are like that. Benefit of it is politicians can't really stop them. You know, generally, like these major infrastructure projects get going and then. You know, NDP couldn't stop Sightsee Dam. They, John Horgan was on site. I would cancel this if I become the premier. And then he became the premier. And then oh, we can't cancel it. It's way too big and it's beyond us. So, you know, it's kind of the way that uh, those major infrastructure works happen. Is, and unfortunately, it's like it is a socially determining uh, and also resource distributing project. Every time new buildings are built, like major developments happen, it's a distribution of resources amongst communities for decades that a deal gets made. And when those deals get made, it can it can mortgage our future, like give up the young people from access. It can do all sorts of stuff. It can let go of history. So those are all the negative sides of it. So, you know, I think being in Chinatown, there's a glimmer of hope always. And we have four four buildings we work with down there and I get to hang out with some of the scene, like the old Chinese people in, that, in the back rooms and talk about, um, you know, the future and try to bring some of those ideas into it. But it's uh, um, still, yeah, it feels just super bleak. So in all ways. <laughs> the thing you dislike was much longer than the thing you like. But there were some positive notes in there, so that's good. <laughs> we've been trained, I think we've been trained to critique more than we have been that's true. To, uh, yeah, that's true. To, to come up with solutions. Actually, that's something maybe really important for this generation is to think about um, that solution focus and and thinking about what we have and what we're standing on, not um, yeah, because other countries are in war, right? They're they're facing death and destruction, like literally. So, <laughs> you know, we as as annoying as it is to raise that every day, you can't, you know, someone's small complaint will say, well, at least we're not at war. You know, that you can't really say that stuff, you know, all the time. But it is true, you know. So from a bigger sense. We do need to look at collectively what's possible. And I think, yeah, I think to my uh, my own family and what they were able to survive from and, you know, inspired to try to make sure other people don't have to go through what they went through. Thank you. Okay. Things, something you like, something you don't like. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so as a prep, it's a, nice, it's a fun job because you always do something very strange and interesting. Uh, right now, we're getting ready to build a castle out of Lego, uh, out of yoga blocks, in the gallery. So you get, and it's so it's not repetitive. It's always interesting. 
with, if you've got like a brain chemistry like mine, I like to build things. I like to know how things work. And um, I get to apply that kind of thinking and planning in a new, different way every time. So I think that's, that's a lot of fun. That's why I still do the job. Um, and what I don't like, I already kind of covered. Um, <laughs> it used to be. I, I know some people who work, uh, I worked with at the Vancouver Art Gallery who's been there since 1980. Back then, it was a job where you could have a house and send kids to college. It is no longer, the industry has decided that the people who do what I do aren't worth it anymore. So that's kind of, uh, yeah, that's the sad thing about where where I am. I wonder why too, because, uh, yeah, I've worked with gallery technicians and... Um it's like another way of thinking. <laughs> so you could just build anything. <laughs> yeah. Make wildest dreams come true. Um, okay, I'm just taking the time. So I think um, I'm going to have ask everyone else to ask you questions. In just, But I do have one more final question. Yeah, I think we have time for my one more final question, then we'll open it up. Um, but uh, the question is, um, going back to who our audience is, is there anything else, is there anything you would want to tell yourself? I mean, at, at the age of the people that are, the age and process of the people that are listening in today. Sorry. What would I uh, tell myself? I guess, like, take a financial literacy course. <laughs> um... I think, Brian, you said something like this about, about being trained to critique. I think when I left art school, I had to kind of retrain myself to do the stuff that I liked doing before I was in art school. And, um, yeah, I felt it was, it was four years of teaching me to question things too much. And... Uh, and I, I was happier as a creative person afterwards, after I got over that, that impulse that had been trained into me. So um, my advice is to forget everything you've learned, how many, I guess. How many years did it take? Ooh. Maybe two or three. I think it depends on like your group of friends, because I think you can have a bunch of people who keep reinforcing that. And if you keep reinforcing it within yourselves, you hold on to it. And then, yeah, you need at least one person to start disregarding it. And then you're like, oh, yeah, look, Jason's much happier than me. And he's doing fun stuff. What's his trick? And then, so, yeah, you figure it out. That would be the opposite. Like, you don't want to have anyone be too successful. And then it's a problem because then everyone's like, oh, we should try to be successful. You know? Well, <laughs> Chasing that yeah. kind of world. Let's go to Berlin. Let's go, uh, you know, do a, make a new Vancouver school or whatever. Kind yeah. Of, you know. Well, I think it was the friends of mine who had the most success as artists were people who dropped that sooner and went back to doing, like, the goofy stuff that Emily Card trained them not to do. I feel like I already gave pretty my advice at the end of my. I thought that was our last question. So, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I guess I don't know. I if I was like, there's a lot more M, or Emily Carr grads than there is jobs. Like just from an economist perspective, and back to the divestment. Like there's no the money to the art organizations is not increasing, but the school has more and more students every year. So what do you do with that? And I, I do feel like being collaborative amongst each other and building upon these skills, maybe seeing this four-year period as an opportunity to sort of build relationships with people who you might then go on to skill up more in different ways. You know, this is like a kind of <clears throat> a starting point. And I guess that's where people go to grad school. Um, but there's options to not necessarily do it through grad school, other types of skills that you can go and get. But yeah, I think not being, uh, I would, let's say for us anyways, it was sort of like being irreverent, being, um, and I, I called it kind of egotistical. When we, were, when we were young, I said, we called it anti-infantilization. 
We say, well, we don't want to be treated like babies. Like, you pay your tuition and do, you know, just be little babies. Well, we, you know, a lot of us traveled not, like, I didn't, I didn't grow up here, so we still traveled from another place, came here, set up, going through the city. We wanted to be people in the city, so, you know, just uh, every time, at least I've overcome some of these barriers. Um, like, I joined the National Galleries Board, and I was second person of color, I think, since 1880, the youngest person, I think, in the history. So I experienced, like this expectation that all these people would be some larger-than-life people. And you experience, well, oh, actually, they're just people. They have their problems. And maybe even more problems actually kind of failed up in a certain way to get up there. But, you know, you experience um, that you can do it if if you sort of imagine yourself to. Not necessarily, in a, you have to be tactical about it, but still. Um, so not especially in the art world, because the art world's full of people who sort of do the gatekeeping or whatever you want to call it. It's also very kind and generous people, making it sound very horrible. <laughs> kind and generous people, but yeah. Um, so just, yeah, when somebody says you can't do it, you know, try it out and see if you could do it. Mm-hmm. Unless he says no, then no, you should follow it. <laughs> probably, it's probably true if he says no. Um yeah, I have a piece of advice too. And I think it's that, I think Jimmy B. Chelsea touched on it a little bit, but I also learned um, pretty quickly that almost anyone will talk to you. Um, I think we we like apply to funding, we apply to shows through these like walls of the internet that we think of as non-people, but they're almost, even be like arts grants are run by a jury of artist peers. Like almost anyone will talk to you if you take the time to find them in advance. <laughs> um yeah, and I just say one more thing um, about the criticality that we learn here at Emily Carr, um, because uh, yeah, I really resonated with what with what both of you said about um, uh, that hypercriticality that is learned here, and uh, just reflecting on how it it makes it difficult to motivate yourself when you're when you're done because you have all these voices you've learned that say that's not quite right. Like, what is everyone going to think about that? All these different things. But it does give you like a foundation of language to talk about some of the topics that we talked about today when we talk about criticizing economy, um, criticizing the ways that um, the world works to oppress some and and elevate others. So uh, both good and bad. Um, With that, I think uh, we're going to open it up if any of our many, many audience members would like to ask a question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Um, oh, one second, you might just give me a second. <laughs> you got it. How important you are. You're so important. Yeah. Oh, I feel special about that. Uh, thank you very much for having here. Um, I really appreciate it, and uh, I guess I learned a lot uh, so far from your uh, advices. Uh, my question will be: I think I kind of have an idea of the the answer, but I really want to hear from three of you. Um, can uh, can we be an entrepreneur by just working from nine to five? Uh, do you guys sacrifice, like how much sacrifice you guys are making in terms of time? Do you guys have enough time for your families? Do you guys have enough time for your health? Um, that will be my question. Um, okay. I'm just... I only have to take care of myself, so it's a lot easier for me to be there for friends, family. Um, I work three jobs, and I work at least 12 hours every day. I have, um, since June, basically have like one day off um, each month. And I also had to move during that time and then find a new housemate, everything like that. I'm somebody that can handle that like high capacity. I'm thankfully like able-bodied, and I don't have... I have a lot of like um, sort of like health privileges, but... Um, it's obviously not sustainable and I don't like working this hard, but I like really love what I do. And I'm also just trying to get myself farther ahead from being like so pushed back from a couple of different like personal crises that I had. Um, and again, a lack of, um, math skills and financial literacy. So that's, um, yeah, I, I'm not... Also trying to, like, even though I'm very positive and I love what I do, um, it's not 
it's not easy. So I'm not trying to like create sort of some martyrdom or like give you a sense of like you can do it, make it happen. But there also are friends, some of my other friends who are making it work for themselves and they're not um, like Napo babies and they're not um, like they actually are dedicated to what they're doing and trying to make it work. So also just really think about, I always think of like a third or fourth way of doing something like it's not yes or no. And like, this is where I sort of lean in to my um, like art school skills is like thinking about what it could be. Could, could I, okay, I have a stupid like <laughs> metaphor. Like sometimes I think I have no food in the house and then I actually realize now I have bread, butter and an egg and then some oh, arugula and like, okay, great. I have a sandwich and like I have protein and everything like that. So. I try to make a little from, I try to make a lot from a little every single day. And I like pride myself in my resourcefulness. And um, another, some other practical things that have helped me is like um, going to a grocery store that has a loyalty program. Um, using Too Good to Go, I get like all of this bread for $7 from Penny Fromaggio and like helps reduce. Um, CO2 levels. I love being frugal and fancy. Um, the other thing is, um, and I don't have a lot of time either, right? Like I've I've got, a, like sometimes I have to, in some of my jobs, I actually have to physically be there. Um, and then I have a credit, just one credit card that um, like has a aeroplan. So if any of my big purchases, like of over $100, I put on there and then that has made me be able to like, um, buy a plane ticket to see my mom because I can't drive like across the Coquihalla. It's not safe in my like in a vehicle I have. Um, it, that was like eighty five dollars, and I'm gonna go to Toronto for Art Toronto, and I got um, that was like one hundred and fifty dollars round trip, like because of the points that I was saving. So again, back to financial literacy, it can like help you problem solve like a lot of those really important and necessary. Um, like fixed costs and everyday costs and then also help you like achieve your dreams without someone telling you no. Anytime someone rejects me, it just like gives me like fire, more fire in my belly to figure out how to make it work. Um, and that's why you ask friends. That's why you, I talk to my friends all the time about this. A couple of my friends have actually started their own businesses and like we've helped each other deal with a very like delicate kind of conversations um, and like ways to put our money. There's like no like shame or anything like that, but um, yeah, and they're also struggling too, but we're there with each other to like pat each other on the back and say like, we can do this, right? Um, it's not, it's not easy. Um, and constantly looking at how to get out of the city. <laughs> uh, but I'm still here. I've been saying that for like two years. <laughs> Um, the work I do to install uh, art exhibitions is done for institutions, and I work in institutions that have good um, structures in place, uh, mostly because they have a trade union representation that it costs the gallery a lot of money to be disorganized enough to have me stay late. And so they, they learn because they have to pay my overtime to be organized. And that is something that changed at CAG when we uh, organized. There is uh, an assumption in art-related jobs that everybody is as dedicated as you and as motivated by the love of art. I mean, we're all there because we like it. I think we could all get jobs in other fields that would pay us better but we're in art and <clears throat> and so there's this expectation of for people because it's like a a passion project that they'll sacrifice more than you would at you know a legal firm or at a construction site and the fact is it doesn't have to be like that and when you put in the correct structures where when you expect you're expecting someone to work 12 hours a day you know it costs your boss that much and they, they'll make choices to not put themselves in that position because you, you're, you're skilled and you deserve to get paid well, right? 
And so, um, yeah, I am happy to work in situations like that. So I have, I guess, a reasonable work-life balance. Yeah. I have a child, and I stop working at three-ish every day, but that's because I have to pick her up, and then real work begins. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, it's a really good question, something I probably would have never thought of. I remember inhaling like dust, building and renovations, buildings of, for the first five years or so. And uh, I borrowed 20 grand from my wife's parents. It's the worst idea. Never do that. Because, um, you know, they'll take credit for everything you do the rest of your life. <laughs> and it's like the loan, even if you paid it back, will never be paid back. So anyway, uh, we did a renovation in a building. And I remember one of my friends on the, we had 70 volunteers. I kid you not, like all of our friends, we just, they were just on the ground chipping away at tile because we couldn't afford a hammer drill. And my wife's dad is a civil engineer. Uh, yeah, he was a refugee, or his family were, but they came to Canada, became, you know, so they're just like, oh my God, like, we should help you. And I'm like, dude, you gave me 20 grand. Like, that's it. I'm not taking your hammer drill. There's no way we're taking anything from you. Just get out of here if you don't want to see us doing this like hard labor. But there was a period where I think we did give a piece of our soul to that work. Um, and I know a lot of cultures have a, word for it or a way of describing it, but often when you start a business or do something quite significant, it could be having a kid, it could be doing a major move, it could be something traumatic in your life, that's kind of it. Like the rest of your life is sort of chilling out. <laughs> now I would say like, I'm not, I'm kind of like, like people say, would you do this again? I'm like, dude, that was like 10 miracles on top of each other. There's no way we would, like I would personally go and redo this. Um, but I you know, I do think like foregrounding health as part of your plans collectively is much smarter than what we what we did. I think it was partly again that like there was a little bit of a punk rock like you know, you know, screw it, we're just going to make it happen ourselves. Like we're tired of all these things. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Maybe she'll come in and say hi. Um, but yeah, so good answer. But take care of yourself. Eat good food, spicy food too. Not just bland food. Yeah. <laughs> any other? Yeah. Any other questions? Do we have a? We don't have an online feed of people possibly asking questions. Do we? There aren't any questions. Okay. Um. Twenty minutes. We make it quicker, Brian. Okay. Um. I'm really inspired by all the speeches and talk is really amazing. Um, I'm actually an alumni as well. So uh, <laughs> I just graduated last year and uh, just secretly skipping. Um, for my past years, I worked in a entrepreneurship with a with my boss and uh, and we're working in a ceramic studio. We started ceramic studio like um, half a year ago. And uh, it's like two days ago, everything's over. So it just suddenly everything's over. I'm now, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like story behind it. So, um, and I'm just kind of wondering if those kind of things just suddenly happen, accidents happen. And just everything's over, and kind of need to restart or find something, find a different path to go. Uh, how do you cope over that, or any advice on that? Yeah. So our our current operating budget across the couple, a few different organizations is about four and a half million that we have every year, and every year we have to make up money, right? And I remember early on, maybe it was more like a hundred thousand the budget. It was like enough to pay. 1.5, 1. 1. something plus, you know, a bunch of costs. Maybe we weren't even being paid. I can't remember. But there was a there was one year where it was like, we need $70,000, otherwise this is done. You know, we're all just going to go. I'm going to go work for eBay or whoever else will take me. Um, and so there was a couple of miracles. Like, I'm not even joking, where it was like, oh, the money came through. We did not expect it. 
we didn't fit in all of the buckets perfectly in terms of how those monies were used, you know, but we survived through it and we built a kind of case around it. But I, I don't, uh, I don't think it's all like skill and hard work. Uh, there is a degree of fortune and there is also, yeah, there's also a, of course, the time of the economics, like right now is one of the hardest times. Like, yeah, everything is compounding. So people are paying, their mortgage rates went up. They pay like half of Canadians who have mortgages, they're all paying $1,000 more per month. So they're, they're spending less money and then everyone's losing jobs. And it's kind of just the people losing jobs are spending less money. So it's all just contracting. And so we'll see what happens in the next year or two. But definitely in if you have that political aptitude of like listening to the news and all those things, it's quite hard to keep an act. At, keep it up, but you'll sort of see like when's a good time to be moving. Right now is a time for people with money to do stuff. Like I'll just be honest, like you can't really get a business started in this current climate. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I mean like we used our student loans. I, I, don't, I think I wrote an essay about this when I was a student. I said, the bank lent me $50,000 or the government lent me $50,000. If I went to the bank and was like, hey, I want to start a business or I went to my parents, I mean, my parents wouldn't do anything. But if you go somewhere, say, I want $50,000, there's none of them would give me the money. But I said, I'm going to go to school. They said, okay, we'll give you the money. So actually, you can go to school as a masquerade to start a business or do whatever else you need to do. And you can also share that with all your pals because when you graduate, especially if you're getting government loans, probably half my friends got their loans forgiven. I don't know if, if you hear this, but... Yeah, so don't tell anyone, but you might get your loans forgiven if you're, uh, yeah, I think Biden did that in the States too recently, some like $5 trillion or something. But anyway, that got a bit, got to cut me off. <laughs> um, I, I was sorry to hear about your, your situation there. Um, and I guess uh, flexibility is the answer? I mean, there's there's a lot of like hokey advice that um, I could <laughs> I could give you that would sound like everybody else's advice about that. But um, yeah, I, it it does happen, and it is random. Like you you were talking about luck. I don't don't take it personal. It has nothing to do with you. Okay. It that happens, and it happens to everybody. Can I can I answer the question as well, <laughs> and then we'll then we'll call it. Okay. Um, uh, I just want to say that, uh, yeah, that that really sucks. But um, it reminds me that um, I think that for depending on where what you're trying to pursue, sometimes that everything stopping becomes routine. <laughs> it becomes routine in like how your how your multi year programming works. Um, if you go into arts education, that's definitely the thing. You could stay on the semester system and then in the summer, you know, what's going on. So, um, but I, I've like, um, besides the kind of um, self-care of change, of like that your body goes through when um, you're going through periods of change, which um, is really important to pay attention to. Um, I do want to say that in retrospect, those moments where everything is done and everything's changing is kind of a... I think of those moments as these really rare openness opportunities. Like, it kind of, they suck. Like, you need to take care of your body, like I'm saying, take care of your health. But um, you are suddenly open to anything, which is not, which is you don't, you can't hold on to for most moments in your life. Um, you know, you're suddenly open to be like, yeah, I could be a baker, whatever. That sounds great. And then you can follow that path and your life changes. So those moments, even though they're the worst, they're like the cru the crucible of when these big, big changes happen in your life, which um, you know define where you go, what you are. Not advice, just reflection. Oh, uh, yeah, I will say like the transfer, like that sort of loss and grief. There's always transformative power in that, and <clears throat> it actually helps you become more fearless to take another leap of faith in the future because you know that. You went through that, and that can it. Whatever you're about to go through next is probably not going to be as bad as it was in the past. So, um, 
or what you just kind of went through and hopefully eventually will overcome. It takes time. Sometimes it takes like two, three, four years, but you will notice there will be benchmarks. Um, yeah, and I think the key is, is that it makes you just more fearless to keep going and try something different and um, not being afraid of having a setback, a setback. Like a, I re- had a terrible breakup a couple of years ago and it was like, I was like, breakups are breakthroughs. And it's kind of what you're saying, where it's like there's this crevice of like potential of like all of these other, um, your vantage point shifts and your whole world shifts. So stick with it. Yeah, you, you, you got, 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 Advice that can work, I don't find it quite often. A couple of the mentors that I've uh, been connected to are people that I've like worked with um, in a like ar- kind of arm's length distance um, at Capture. So um, maybe at this like at school, or if you're going to art shows, or um, like art openings, um, or if you have some other friends who know somebody who has like a skill level that you're like, oh, they have a cool job. They they seem like you're interested in what they do, and you can see that some of your like goals and your like the things that you want and where you want to be are like aligned with who they are. Then I would um, reach out to them and ask like. What's been kind of amazing about working at Capture is like having these blue sky ideas where I never really, being at Emily Carr was so focused on like this world here on campus and the writings of people from like um, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s and not necessarily of the present that like just imagining something that seemed totally like outside of reach, but actually like reaching out to that person and saying, hey, I'm a student, this is what I'm interested in, have some, re- have had done some research, so it shows that you are serious and what your goals are and like be very, try to be as clear as possible and then just see what happens and like send that email or like go up to them, introduce yourself, like don't, don't get in your own way of your own potential and um, don't really be afraid of being successful in in however you define that. So that's how I would advise. Um, people are honored to be a mentor as well, oftentimes as well. They are like, it's a huge compliment that someone would want to kind of work closely with them and learn about how they work and what they do. Um. Yeah, this is kind of just building off of what you said earlier and what you just said is like, I think you said um, that you can find people will talk to you. Yeah. So, yeah, as imposing as someone might seem in a position, they are just also normal people who will talk to you if you can start the conversation. And and yeah, if you take it seriously, like you said, and, and follow through and like make it clear that you. Care, that is a big step in. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like asking for directions, I guess, a bit. <clears throat> but you know, in this place, you're 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 you have a rich choice selection of potential professors or other people out there. But I would say choose someone who also feels like they kind of see your authentic self a bit, and you don't feel like you have to perform too much. At the same time, somebody who wants to push you. So you're not just sort of like uh, someone they care about, but someone who they'll test you a bit and push you a little bit. Yeah, and then, yeah, just getting your shit together, your house in order in terms of, you know, like we're hiring for three jobs right now. We get 
a lot of applications in. I think we had one every three hours for one of them, like for the last 24 hours or a uh, few days. And it, those, they come to the table like they don't want to be read. You know, like they're not even, like the, the basic stuff, like look at that Capture Photography Festival, looks beautiful. Like it should look like that, minus the photos, but you know, because it's a CV, but like given, yeah, but it, I mean, it's, you got to make it look pretty and you got to make the content strong and you don't need to lie or cheat or anything, but there's a, you got to show up, uh, yeah, looking, looking the part, wanting to be there, recognizing it's a competition to a degree and, uh, yeah, not at the same time not being, you know, over the top. Like someone says, you know, I'm too busy, then I'm too busy. Pushing. It's not gonna help. So yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Too hard about people on their resumes. But you know, from the employer's side, I constantly see these things. Ah, it's like, it's like a spelling mistake. You got you have to put this like it's too templatey, you copied this too, too templatey, and this one's a bit too naked, you know. So all those things. Yeah, you learn them. As you go, someone in this, there's some one of the career counseling people in here better know what the hell they're doing. Is that you? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. 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 I think I think. Do you, does anyone does anyone want to plug the plug 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 the organization who's putting this on as a pathway for mentorship? <laughs> No, but uh, I actually wanted to say, like, we have the event um, on the 24th. It's about building your network. So you should maybe come to that panel as well and hear about those people because that's the, actually the topic of next talk. So, And also, Shamka Center has, if you're a student at Emily Carr, but even if you're not, if you're an alumni, it's free to public. You can just go to our website and actually find some good, helpful resources that we did with uh, career development over here. Um, on how to write a good email, for example. So. Yeah. Uh, I think, and I think it's really important to, uh, my advice to you is that when you're looking for a mentor, don't be transactional. And, uh, you know, try to build a genuine connection with someone. So someone you admire and that you're going to learn from, but that it needs to be a genuine connection. And you can't be interested. Don't come at it where you're, um, I think what Brian touched on about sensing what people can give to you. Be respectful of people's boundaries and what they want. You know, and that's just work on your interpersonal skills. It helps, you know, too. So anyways, you guys say, were amazing. Thank one you more so little much. Thing for, uh, I think you could volunteer. I know volunteering is the worst thing. We don't have any volunteers. <laughs> Honestly, we have zero volunteers because you don't pay them, right? It's a problem. But uh, there is intergenerational organizations, art galleries, a lot of the artists from centers and things like that. They need board members. They need people to be involved. And it's a good way to see the cross-section of what's actually going on, m make some friends, and, you know, when you find yourself in a lull of work, you know, you have that connection point. You're at Emily Carr right now, so you get those, a lot of those connections, but you won't be soon, right? It's not going to be forever. So you'll be, start, start crossing over into the, to that world. And, um, yeah, just, you're going to get rejected, even though you're saying, I'll do free labor. And then you're going to find the right person and the right way to do it in a kind way and hope. And if it's not an artist run center, you know, like industries have their own, um, associations and other types of events and things like that. So you can get involved. Um, yeah, I know VIF, uh, where I'm on the board, they have lots of volunteers and that's like a good spot. Although you'd be competing with the, uh, the seniors who want free, free tickets, but <laughs> sort of elbow you out of the way with their landlord lanyards, but you, 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 it's a good, good place to get to know some people and intergenerational too. Well, I think that's it. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. And um, yeah, a round of applause. There's only three of us. <laughs>